getting better. Um, Bill Gates wrote, and the Gates Foundation support a huge amount of global health, but we don't necessarily agree with everything they do. They think everything's getting better. They're very influenced by Hans Rosling and a lot of the other stuff. And in many ways, they're correct that in human development terms, a lot of the indicators are going in the right direction. But if you read someone like Mark Mazowa, who's a historian from Colombia, who wrote a very interesting book called Governing the World, he thinks that we are seeing increasingly a world of weakened state institutions, all of the problems listed there that I won't read out to you. But I'll read the final quote, the fundamental 19th century insight that effective internationalism rests on effective nationalism remains pertinent. Voters around the world still see their primary allegiance to their national state rather than any larger polity, which is very relevant to my country currently imploding under the weight of Brexit because people are very suspicious of the European Union for all kinds of reasons. I'm not going to get into that. The other issue, of course, is that most developing countries do not get um, money from wealthy countries. It's the other way around. If you look at it, only a small number of people actually do get any. Uh, 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 I didn't switch it on. <laughs> You're going to have to tell me how long I'm wittering on. Anyway, so basically, we know that most people don't get, you know, they're developing countries enrich the West, basically. And this is the shameful uh, assessed contributions both to the UN and even worse to the World Health Organization. Basically, since about 1990, the level of money, this is my calculations, adjusted to 2016 dollars, uh, of assessed contributions, member states are basically just not paying anything into WHO, and so they have to raise money and then prostitute themselves in the way that David was complaining about. So about $500 million represents about 1 32nd of the research budget of Amazon you know, I mean, this is the difference. If all the member states of the world invest in their health insurance of WHO, anyway, I have my say. We can talk about that. Right, back to the lecture. The power of sympathy groups at the social age. First thing anyone ever says to me, what's a sympathy group? What are you wittering on about? And so if you look, I use it from an anthropological classification of human groups from Robin Dunbar, who says basically groups are not random. Groups in society, and we're social animals, move up a hierarchy. From your survival clique, those are your four or five family members who are going to look after you when you have your stroke, or you know, deal with survival. Sympathy groups, it's a tripling hierarchy. The affinity band, which in hunter-gatherers was the group of families coming together to protect against predators. And then your active network, which is the limits of your social brain. We have a big brain, they argue, because that manages all your social relationships. And you don't go much beyond 150, despite Facebook and, <laughs> and uh, Twitter and all that. The people you know are about your Christmas card list. Well, nobody sends Christmas cards anymore, but you can get my point. And so all of you, I would challenge to say, have been members of sympathy groups. And we don't mean sympathy as pity. We need sympathy in the 18th century meaning of the word, if you like, harmony, empathy. There was actually a professor of medicine and sympathy in Edinburgh in the late 18th century. So that's what we're talking about. And what do I mean? Well, I'm going to illustrate chosen pictures. So we were for 98% of our uh, evolution hunter-gatherers, hunters hunting groups, gatherers gathering groups to protect and to share strategies. Farmers come together in groups, forestry people, in the beginning of history, if you like, rather than prehistory, Greek philosophy was done in groups, basically booze-ups in the evening. They would all come together in groups of people, drink a lot, um, abuse women or boys, and then do a bit of philosophy. <laughs> and that's how Aristotle and Plato did their work. This I love. This is a picture from Siena Hospitali. Um, by Domenico di Bartoli from the uh, 15th century. Um, and this is the social hospital. On the left, you've got a person shaking a urine test. There's a little bit of surgery going on. There's the hospital committee with the black hats behind. On the right, an oblate friar who is doing end-of-life care. 
there's a dog in there and a cat to do a bit of biophilia and make people happy. <laughs> David has a dog, as I've discovered, um, to make me happy. Um, and this is the uh, where on the left you've got a women's group who are wet nursing abandoned infants, and on the right the hospital committee coming together to betroth one of the abandoned infant girls to someone and reintegrate them into his society. The social function of the hospital. I think some of our hospitals have something to learn from this, that actually there, there is this social function. Um, the roots of American capitalism lie in puritanical stuff and the levelers. So the levelers were a group who talked about um, uh, basically a whole manifesto for coming together and living and sharing a kind of permaculture world. We had scientific groups. This is the Lunar Society. I won't go into all of this. But they, some of the biggest brains of the 18th century inventions, used to meet for dinner once a month in uh, the time of the lunar appearance in Birmingham. Coffee shops are considered the roots of uh, industrial innovation. Uh, we use sympathy groups at the lowest level, the section of a platoon in the army, which is very militarized. Uh, in politics, leaders and rebels like uh, Madiba would have a sympathy group of colleagues. Uh, this can be for honorable causes, if you look actually in Russia, since shock therapy in 1990, they've had what's called the Systema Blatt of modern oligarchic Russia uh, presidio. You could do exactly the same for Trump with about 15 loyal <laughs> people around him. And virtually all politicians work that way. The terrorists who attacked um, the Twin Towers on 9-11 were a classic 15 sympathy group as was the groups that took out Osama bin Laden and did an extrajudicial killing to. Uh, and if you look at the history of Red China, which is fascinating, um, in the early days in the Long March, you had a lot of um, theatrical groups that would go around and interact with villagers. And it was a very interesting map. <coughs> now started with passionate belief and sympathy groups and then ended up in the Great Leap Forward and the catastrophe of the famine. Uh, by removing all these groups and in implementing um, collectivization to mimic the, the Soviets, which ended in disaster. In music, Duke Ellington and his orchestra, classic sympathy group. In sport, we have Barcelona there and the South African World Cup team of 2010 uh, with their director. And that. So what is a sympathy group more specifically? Classically, is theater as well. Theatre is usually about 12 to 15 people. You have the beneficiaries, the actors, the enablers, the director there is Peter Brook, uh, and his sidekick there talking about. And neighbors are, if you like, actors or people coming together with a common cause. And then this is a suffragette group from 1892 in Australia, campaigning for votes for women. And I would say, they have a focus, a group, they're focused around a particular thing, they iterate and meet a lot, they build trust and they implement strategies. So if you go back, I like that brilliant. Ben affits the benefits of sympathy groups, right? Do you like that? Beneficiaries, neighbors, neighbors, that's who they are and what they do is focus, iterate, trust and strategies. So, experiments. Most animals, do not do social stuff. It's very much the selfish gene. But marmosets, top left, bush-tailed tamarins, and humans look after babies, cooperative nurturing. Chimps don't. Chimps won't let anyone near their baby. They'll attack them. But then they abandon them after about a year. So Sarah Hurdy wrote a book about this. And I, the reason I got interested in this was because we did a study of health education in the early 90s in Kathmandu for poor slum women, and we did traditional health education, two doses of about an hour each with women using the usual size. And we did a randomized control trial because that was when they were becoming fashionable, and we showed no impact whatsoever on anything. And it was really embarrassing, and then I presented it to people in London and elsewhere, and a psychologist stood up and said, yeah, but you know about 
than Dura's social cognitive model, don't you? And I kind of stared. And, so, you know, I think I have read that. So, <laughs> you know, and, and anyway, I learned that actually operating in peer groups could be more effective. And then we heard about the warming project in Bolivia from Lisa Howard Bradman, Save the Children Fund. They'd done a really interesting study. I hadn't really evaluated it properly. And by then, I'd been going to the London school courses, and they were all saying, you've got to do cluster randomized trials and stuff. So we went to, back to Nepal, because I've worked there a lot for so And uh, we gave out, dished out cameras to local people. And this is their world of work, subsistence, agriculture, all delivering at home. And their health service was largely shamans, so-called dummy jankeries. And we decided to adapt the Bolivia model into what's called a community action cycle, identify and prioritize problems for a few months of meetings, get the women to plan strategies, put them into practice, evaluate them together, use local volunteers who are not health workers to lead this process. And we set up a matched cluster randomized trial. And you may say, well, that the red areas were each about you know, 60 square kilometers of mountain, the blue were control, and you'd say, well, there's bound to be contamination there. And actually, Nepal was designed by God for cluster randomized trials, <laughs> because the yellow boundaries are raging rivers or 18,000 foot mountains. So actually, the contamination was very little. But we basically got together about 200 groups and in various random forms, and they covered about 7,000 population, they talked about it. And at the end, we analyzed the data, and I was convinced with epidemiologist David Osrey, there's no way we would get an impact, because we didn't have enough women in the groups, we thought. And we showed a 30% reduction in neonatal mortality. And we were, of course, delighted to publish it in The Lancet, and no one believed us. People said, come on, we're chatting, you know, having an impact. And also, we got an impact on maternal mortality. Although it wasn't the primary hypothesis of the trial, and the data was quite small. So anyway, they were right. You should be skeptical of one study. So we set up some others. So then we did a much better study with another former master's student, with not much money, to be honest, in the tribal populations of East India, Jharkhand, and Rissa. And we ran that for three and a half years. And it was bigger and better and more clusters. And we showed a 32% reduction and in neonatal mortality rates by mobilizing women. And we thought, this is amazing. And then a good maths person came on board and showed a way of looking at the gradual impact, which I won't go into, Christina Barbell, but it showed the time lag from the time you set the group up. It takes about nine months before you start to get this benefit kicking in. So it has biological plausibility as well as the trial in terms of um, you know, Bradford Hill criteria and things like that. So in, to cut 20 years short, we did seven cluster randomized. In fact, we've done about 11 now. And they were in different parts. We did two in Malawi, we did urban India, and some were positive and some were not. And before anyone thinks I led all of this, it was very much team efforts at different sites with many different incredibly competent people. Um, and then we, we, at the same time as we analyzed the India thing, we did a look to the India, the Bangladesh study and found no impact whatsoever. And this was in 500,000 population. And all the Bangladeshi colleagues cried and then swore at me. And, we, and then I said, no, 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 this is science. You do positive, negative trials. They said, no, no. <laughs> Nepal and India got a positive result. We failed, you know. And then we unpicked it and said, well, why? Was it that maybe the talking wasn't as good? And then they hit me over there. They said, Bengali women can talk. <laughs> and then was it the conservatism or what? Or was it the dose? And we realized we got the coverage wrong. We didn't get enough pregnant women into the groups. And so we reanalyzed that. And then we did a meta-analysis, or rather Audrey Prost led one, which was, if you divide up our studies, into those that really got a kind of critical mass of about 30% of locally pregnant women attending the groups, then you had an impact of one third. And this was big numbers, over 120,000 births, and likewise in maternal mortality. 
So we thought this was important, and the next thing we did was to take it to WHO. This was before I worked there, because we wanted to get it into policy. And they put you through this grade process, which is quite tough. And they set up a meeting, it took about 18 months, and they review you, and they, you have a bit of a fight. Um, and it was good. I mean, it was, it was brilliant. And a wonderful person called Annie Portella, who I subsequently worked with, did a lot of the work and produced this independent recommendation for introducing this approach in rural, marginal populations. The next thing is, well, does it really work at scale? You know, Africa and Asia and everywhere is awash with pilot projects. So um, we thought it did. We, we've seen it scale up in lots of... The bottom person is Arti... Uh, bottom left is Arti Ahuja, Secretary of Health in India, and she scaled it up across a state with a population of 45 million and introduced to like over 120,000 groups in her own budget. So this is quite low cost. That was evaluated reasonably well in a, by an independent group. And the bottom right is a politician from Malawi who got very involved in this and helped to support it. And there is a biology to this. So Michel O'Don, who was a kind of uh, humanizing obstetrician in Britain who introduced incense and water births and music. And, and he said to me something really powerful. He said, you got to understand, oxytocin controls everything, uh, but the biggest um, antagonist to it is adrenaline. So if you stress women, you affect their labor, their breastfeeding, and everything. And, and so I think that's true, and there is also a lot of increasing evidence that if you have a stressed mother, that transmits itself to babies in various clever biological ways. So we could do that. And groups can protect you against shocks, what's called consumption smoothing, so if you have a climate event or a food security event or whatever, um, if you're in a group, then the group protect you and you get, and that's a very, and the economists have analyzed this. And I saw this in Nepal because we did this study in Mapuampur and then we left and the groups kept on. And when the earthquake happened in 2015, we went back and tried to contact all of them. And over 70%, nearly 80% of the groups were still running and a lot of them were getting engaged in the response to that. So how do women groups, women's groups work? A lot of people want to believe it's just giving them messages. And I think conversation is much more than that. It's about shared memory, solidarity, their holistic approach. They'll go off and do things that you don't expect, which are really powerful. Reduce stress, shared resources, consumption, smoothing, and then agitation, the political thing in Bang. In Bangladesh, a lot of our women are standing for elected office now and asking why. So just to finish, how am I doing? Yeah, all right, five minutes. How might we tackle 21st century problems with this approach? So I've written a book. Okay, I'm here to sell a book, basically. <laughs> Except it's not published until the end of September. The hardback will be expensive. But I've discovered that although you do a Kindle version, and although on Amazon they fix the price at the European price, on iBooks you can do it by region. So I'm going to stick an African one in at like the minimum 99 pence. So if you want to download it, you're very welcome. And then if you write a lovely review, I'll send you, you know, flowers. <laughs> anyway, so I, I, a lot of this is covered there. Um, I, I think that we need to bring much more science and implementation science to this about what works, what doesn't work, and it's got to be a marriage of the quantitative and the qualitative, as Asha has suggested. Uh, this is a quote from Christopher Hitchens, from Deming, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And I love this. This is a tweet from someone from Nepal. He said, I develop them. The idea that the solution to an economic, political, social, or humanitarian problem is to build a website. <laughs> I thought you'd like that, David. You know, mobile phones will solve everything. But I think, you know, the one thing I did help to catalyze, I think it's the only thing I did in three years at WHO of any significance, was to catalyze a global network on quality of care, which I think is a massive issue. And we, from day one, we said this has got to be country-led, not donor-led. And so all the countries came together last year. There are now 12 in the network, 
covering half of all maternal deaths in the world. And I think they touched on all kinds of things which involve audit cycles, links with the community, not least of which is a major issue of quality, uh, is dignity and respect, which is missing so often from many places. I think in WASH, which is the disaster of the Millennium Development Goals, water, sanitation, and hygiene, you know, many more people have mobile phones than toilets. And that this is somewhere which is not a technical solution. It's technical and cultural and social, and we need to all come together on that. Antimicrobial resistance in maternity units and neonatal units is hugely growing problem. I know from South Africa, from Delhi, from many parts of the world, bugs I never saw when I trained in neonatology are killing uh, babies and they'll kill mothers as well. And a lot of it is to do with why aren't we getting groups together around hand washing and hygiene, which in many hospitals is absolutely terrible. And actually better in Africa than many other parts of the world, because you do take hygiene more seriously, but nonetheless, most places do it badly, including my own country. So that's a big issue. But moving on, we have a pandemic of loneliness in old age. When I looked into the figures, it's staggering how many people live in isolation. And when I looked into this, I discovered there is not a single trial published on how to ameliorate social isolation for our senior citizens who have given so much. And this is not difficult to do, and I've been trying to bully John Beard at the World Health Organization, who heads up aging, to do something. For example, however, there have been studies on men's sheds. This is an Australian invention that accept the fact that men are a little bit uh, unable to communicate their feelings, but they will if they've got a shed and uh, they've got something to work on or bang a nail into. So they set up their whole network of men's sheds, which are actually very powerful. But this is something I want to tell you about. So, I've gone and forgotten it. Levitt, Dr. Levitt, are you in the room? No, she's not here. Did, where? Oh, hi. I discovered this yesterday. Now, this is the most important part of my talk, because I'm leaking some very important information. So, these are, this is the data on diabetes in South Africa. And look at the staggering. So blue is uh, men and green is women and between 1990. And you're in an absolutely massive epidemic along with obesity and all the rest of it. And uh, the same is true in diabetes, in, in diabetes, in Bangladesh, where I've worked with the Bangladesh Diabetic Association for about 18 years. And so before I left about four years ago, we set up a trial there, this time to look at what they decided would be men's groups and women's groups talking about diabetes and hypertension. And we randomized a big study, which we managed to get funded, um, run by Kishwar Azad and Ed Fotra and people, but I am involved. And there were three arms, control, mobile phone messaging twice a week, people enrolled, and community groups. And I've never presented this, this is highly confidential. I don't want you tweeting it. Um, this is the only thing I do, I invent the acronyms. So this was one of mine actually, the D Magic trial, diabetes mellitus action through groups or information for better control. And this is the result, and I don't know the code. I kind of think I do. But this is the arms of the trial. And the staggering thing is, which no one will believe, is that in the baseline and the follow-up surveys after two years of running this, in one of the arms, there's a 64% reduction in the combined outcome of diabetes and intermediate hyperglycemia. So pre-diabetes and diabetes, which affects over 30-year-olds in Bangladesh, about 35% of people, which is a kind of staggering finding. So it could be the mobile phones, it could be the groups. <coughs> and then we looked at those that started with pre-diabetes, and they also show a much lower risk of moving on to diabetes over that period. So this is, this is not published yet, it's being written up at the moment. It might all be wrong, we might get laughed out of court. 
But I think it's very interesting, and I think there is uh, scope for obviously repeating this in many different settings, including my own country. Finally, I'm not going to go into this because I talk about this in the book, about how we might use imaginative approaches to prisoner rehabilitation. I know about the Forgiveness Project, which Desmond Tutu is involved with, about improving ownership of health services, particularly for young people. Consulting us is not enough. Uh, engage us. Um, in ownership of um, health facilities, this is a health committee in Australia. They're a bit old-fashioned in Australia, aren't they? I thought. <laughs> they look a bit... I'm sure this was perhaps taken four or five years ago. But, um, but this is really important, how we cultivate. Social accountability is a buzzword at the World Bank, but we've got to translate it into reality on the ground. And I think it is extremely important. I think this is important. I think so much psychosis, 50% of psychotic breakdowns occur with, have symptoms before the age of 14. And we're not, I mean, I know the Brit British situation, so I can imagine elsewhere, is terrible. We don't pick up children. Do we intervene early? Could putting them into groups to discuss issues or spot? And corruption in health. This is from Bangladesh, when I flew in a couple of years ago, a bribe for everything in the public health sector. This is a report in Malawi, where I also go licensed to loot. This is from Kenya, which was the $50 million that went missing from the maternal health budget a couple of years ago. Uh, President Kagame sacking the health minister over corruption. Um, Medical Council of India largely responsible for corruption <coughs> in healthcare, reveals committee. And in case I'm picking on countries, this is Britain. NHS fraud and error costing the UK seven billion pounds a year. This is a taboo topic. We don't talk about it, but but it's all about social trust. It's all about building areas in which corruption doesn't thrive because there's social trust. And finally, the most important thing is we're all doomed. <laughs> we're not all doomed, but if we don't get our act together very fast, we are moving up the worst part of the projected curve. Everything that's happening is happening faster than we people projected, and we're in deep trouble because this is happening at one degree of warming, and we are not heading towards a sustainable future. And even if we implement the Paris Agreement, we're heading up beyond three degrees. And most climate scientists think that would be catastrophic for food security, for water, water security, I think you know something about, and various other things. So on that, did participation empower women? I think I've gone on too long here. This is the really crucial thing. Is participation a panacea or a placebo? The Marxists, mentioning no names, <laughs> but Marxists would say you've got to deal with the means of production, which leads to uninterrupted disturbance of <coughs> social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation. So they would be skeptical. Uh, the Orientalists, like Edward Said, would say, don't have simplistic notions of power and don't obliterate the role of classes, economics, insurgency, and rebellion. So they would probably say participation doesn't. Gayatri Spivak, who's written a lot on gender and uh, issues, talks about the subtle term, the person removed from all lines of social mobility, barred from access to public resources. And she says, if the subaltern is to be taught to speak, as she must be, humanitarian efforts won't cut it. We need infrastructural follow-up. So they would all be a little bit skeptical, and I would agree with that skepticism. Gandhi was more of a village Twaraj, was all about oceanic circles in villages rippling up to change society and to bring about self-rule <laughs> rather than just home rule. But this guy inspires me a bit because Franz Fanon was a revolutionary from our, he was a Martinican in Algeria who influenced all of the colonial insurgencies, if you like, in Africa. But he was a psychiatrist and he said, don't see national liberation, liberation as the simple answer. Post-colonial nations will replace oppressors with other political and economic elites. I think this might ring a bell. Uh, and he said, Superiority and inferiority, why not simply try to touch the other, feel the other, discover each other? He saw most psychiatric conditions, mental health problems, as related to oppression from colonial period. I'll skip Jürgen Habermas and Hannah Arendt, who talks about 
power not being the property of an individual that belongs to a group and remains in existence only so long as the group keeps together. Um, I do like a lot of what Foucault says, but he you know, maybe went too far, but power is everywhere. I really like this paper from a certain eminent person near here who recently published that community programs must guard against the hubris of relying on a single approach or hierarchy of evidence. But I'm going to give the final word to the person who you're celebrating the centenary of, who I think embodies that, that kind of tension between the structural change that you need to address the violence of discrimination like apartheid, but also embrace the idea of the collective, of communities coming together and also solving the problem, creating an ecology, if you like, for change in a political struggle which David taught me about. And on that note, I'm going to finish. We're in a political struggle in Britain right now. I'm going to finish on today's headline in the Sun newspaper in Britain, which says, don't you know there's a bloody game on <laughs> So regardless of politics, we've all got to go and watch the football. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter or sign up to my blog and podcast or buy the book for 99p, I might even be able to find a discount. Like you know, actually. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm sorry I've had a
agents of socialization, that is the feminine. Because if you are going to comment here or comment in other institutions such as the, the religion or, or anything, it means that you're going to miss the, the fundamental point of us trying to resolve these issues. Because these social predicaments, we're going to face them until the end if we're not going to face the first one, that is yeah. the feminine. But then in the continuation, in terms of the corruption, I believe that corruption will never end. Because if the government or if the institution will say us about corruption, ending the corruption, it is paramount important that we focus on how this money are rendered or how this money are given to this institution. Because they're supposed to be, in, a, in, in terms of transparency and accountability, the, the role of the government was supposed to check each and every trans, uh, transaction that goes to each and every department. So that it, 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 in terms of the annual report that is going to be given by a certain department, it means that the government is also involved. Because you find that each and every year, each and every country lose money. You see, because it means that people want to, to, to be based on the development of their self-interest. Because that is the problem that we are facing in our society. And that problem is not going to change if you're not going to balance between agency and public then it means the problem that we have is a problem of will and a problem of interest. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a wide-ranging lecture and a very sort of wide-ranging commentary um, touching on many points. And so I don't know if you want to... No, well, I, I agree with you. I think the two things. One is the family. Before, I, I was only focusing on one of those layers, and all, all the layers are important. And family is what gets focused on a lot in terms of human capital and education and the rest of it. And clearly, that is the most important thing. But I was looking at one of the other levels, but I agree with that. And then this balance between the individual and uh, altruism, if you like, or, the, or the, us as social animals, is always a tension. My, my thought is that in modern society and in capitalism and the modern economies, the shift towards individualism has gone too far. And we've lost our social being. And I think actually emphasizing that more than the technologies that are bombarded over us is an issue for, for, for us to debate. Thank you, Tony. Are there any other comments or reflections? I'm Suzanne Grove, I'm from Chemistry staff member. I'm also a founding member of a childhood cancer support group. Um, my child was diagnosed almost 10 years ago and was given weeks to live, and he's now nine years in remission because you can never 